everybody. This is Sangeeta Saxena, editor of Aviation and Defense Universe, getting you live from New Delhi. And we are on the eve of the Indian Army Day, which is tomorrow morning for us. And uh, here we are in the process of talking about a core of the Indian Army, which is generally not spoken about much but has one of the most important roles. It paves the way, it leads the infantry. It's always there, you know, to make way for everybody who's going ahead and marching ahead in the forces. And this is the core of signals. And here we have with us today, a third generation army officer and a general officer from the Corps of Signals, Major General Love Bikram Chan, and very fondly known to us as General Love Chan. And uh, sir, it's wonderful to have you here. And, uh, you know, it's a special occasion with the Army Day and a very special occasion because, you know, we want the world to know what the court does. There is a huge audience sitting outside who wants to know that what is the Court of Signals all about? So today, sir, is dedicated to what is the Court of Signals all about sir, and your experiences with the court. So welcome to ADU's chat room, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking to ADU and uh, and and I'm sure uh, you know on a lighter note, uh, 15th Jan happens to be the uh, wedding anniversary 47 of the late Queen of England and uh, and and she say, shares this uh, wedding anniversary with my father. So on their 50th anniversary, there was an invite that anybody who's served in the uh, Indian Army uh, there and because my father fought the Second World War, there's an open invite that they could join in uh, for the celebrations in uh, London, Buckingham. Wow. Okay, they're on lighter side. So there's a connect between 15 Jan. That's a little interesting thing. Uh, you know, uh, you rightly said uh, signals is an invisible uh, arm, but a very important one. Uh, like is always said, uh, that a that a commander can command uh, till where he can throw his desk or a file or his voice. So with that, uh, there's been considerable changes which has taken place. So I'll just first give a very brief glimpse of the core of signals uh, history. Uh, there's not much of record of the signals, now when I say record of signals, I'm talking about the communications and mo uh, means of communication prior to 1857. Uh, then the core of signals, as we see today, broadly evolved in three phases. Uh, one is prior to 1911, where uh, the there was no organized communications uh, with, within the uh, armed forces of the uh, then uh, the Royal Indian uh, Armed Forces. Uh, then came the second phase, uh, which is from uh, 1911, uh, that is 15th August, 15th, sorry, 15th February 1911, when uh, the Corps of Signals uh, was uh, raised until 1920. It is interesting that they were actually uh, raised as companies of engineers and pioneers. So that is where uh, we always say that uh, engineers or the sappers are uh, are uh, have a, are, are parents, so we can uh, have a parental claim on sappers. Uh, then comes uh, 1920 to 1947, wherein uh, initially div signal companies, that is 31 and 32 were raised. And uh, the first... Uh, uh, commander who can be equated equivalent to the signal officer in chief, who is now heading, who heads the Corps of Signals today, was uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel S. H. Powell. And then the first, then comes after 1947, wherein it was the signals, the Indian signals which was raised. Uh, therein, um, the first SONC. Indian officer was General Amir General Aipa, and he's uh, a very famous uh, person, and he took over in 1954. 
in a stop gap there were a lot of british officers and uh, the person to hand over to uh, general uh, ayappa was uh, brigadier akhurst who, who had it over right with that as a background uh, so how it all started communications was you know there would be smoke signals akin to what was the red indians used to follow pigeons uh, there were uh, you know uh, seismographs uh, lights flags uh, hand signals and so on those were the primitive days and uh, why it is important to understand there is because signals are always not only in india world over when i say signals i'm talking about communications so when i say signals it is an acronym of communications whether it is today it is having having a c4 or c5 there with you know command control communication computers and so on and it sees get, getting added like cyber is also there so with all these c's as and uh, whenever the need of communications based on the operational requirements the operational battlefield uh, arose signals um, emerged they were always a step ahead so during the er- erstwhile days of you know Uh, uh, trench battle hand to hand combat the ra- ranges of weapons was very small so all these signals and uh, you know signaling by light uh, semaphores heliographs everything was quite okay then as the rage and reach and the intensity of the battle uh, of why fighting of, of, of five or the uh, war fighting capabilities uh, enhanced so did the communication and that is where the advent of wireless and uh, came up so from those days of wireless and you know morse code hf vhf uh, those uh, magnet magnet for telephones and what have you those are the ones which is there so now comes the advent of uh, second world war wherein again an aspect of uh, electronic warfare came up uh, primarily to detect the uh, st- strikes uh, by the uh, by the uh, german forces uh, onto the mainland england and uh, that is where the radars and all these came up so that is a first form of electro- electronic warfare which came up if you see till here it was all uh, valve uh, you know the valve versions and all that with with the advent of uh, the transistorization uh, then the digital uh, uh, space was entered and then as and when it is there now, and now today we are in the 21st century which is called the um, the century of miniaturization and computerization where you have the 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 advanced aspects of robotics unarmed uh, unarmed uh, vehicles or platforms uh, killer uh, killer uh, robot uh, ro- uh, robots uh, you know and uh, ai uh, clouds Uh, virtualization all that is where uh, it has advanced so you see uh, the progress or the the advancement of the weapon system would not have happened if the communications did not keep pace with it like if you, if you are flying a uh, 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 say a, a a predator from thousands of kilometers away if you were not able to control it command it even override it you know kill no kill uh, whether to destroy a target and the communication not matching the ranges would not have been there so in a nutshell that is what is the importance of the role of signals and whenever i said this i you see most of it is actually something which is either uh, a means which is invisible especially the electromagnetic spectrum so that is why signals has a, a very uh, uh, a very uh, important role uh, but it's not visible to everybody that is the uh, aspect right say nutshell of how the core of signals uh, to summarize to you know put it in in a in a very uh, lucid and uh, simple form right sir and sir uh, one thing which we would like to understand from you i'm sure the audience would like to know what does the signals do in the war when we say that it paves the way for the infantry to move ahead okay Uh, you know uh, when uh, i was a young yo uh, that is as a second lieutenant uh, we always used to be uh, told that uh, as a second lieutenant you would be an advisor uh, to the commander so you know you would be a sparrow minus sparrow is a 
uh, is the nickname for signals. And Sparrow would be the company commander of a brigade selling company, giving direct communication support to the brigades as also advisory role and support role to the infantry battalions. Or if it is, an, uh, is a brigade signal company of artillery or uh, mechanized or armor accordingly, right? So as a Sparrow miner, uh, we were always taught that firstly, uh, the technical considerations and the operational considerations have to both match. Uh, when you're going to provide this communication uh, support. So when you're looking at the uh, infantry, I still remember as a second lieutenant, you, there used to be uh, a, a, you know, a training carders uh, for the infantry, wherein we would uh, train them into en enhance their skills. In those days, now this is in the, uh, you know, the early 80s was only on uh, field cable, uh, that is a copper cable or carrier cord or uh, all the, or the well versions or crystal uh, frequency versions of uh, communication system. So we should teach them how to use it, optimally use it. And if there were any issues on their communications, uh, that is how we would uh, support them. So every company like uh, a diff signal regiment will have a brigade signal company, which is again got detachments which are absolutely affiliated with the uh, infantry, right? This I'm just talking about the organization, and then I'll say what is the uh, how you how it uh, supports them. Thereafter, there's uh, every unit has got inher inherent communications, which we uh, refer to as regimental signalers, uh, and they also do uh, courses, the RSO regimental signal officers course in uh, in MCT Mao. Uh, so they also provide handle their own communication. Like there's a communication from the section to the uh, to the platoon platoon to the company company to the talent they will be uh, providing that both uh, uh, line and uh, radio right now similarly there are certain things uh, so this is every entity has to have inherent communications so how do we support you know we support in a much larger uh, role because uh, we always ensured that the infantry or any other arms that we support or even uh, the services that we support should not be uh, utilizing uh, their own communication systems uh, for uh, connecting rearward or for mundane. They should always be ahead of the, uh, you know, the, their uh, FUPs or uh, their uh, advanced, uh, you know, generally FUPs and RVs. That is it. So, the policy has always been that the signals provide communications as close to the international border or to the target as possible, right? So up to the battalion headquarters and beyond. And thereafter, you know, if the if they have to call for a air support or call for an RT support, that is where the signals also come up. Uh, they have got organized into uh, tentacles or uh, you know. Uh, detachments which provide you that support and command and control. So, in a nutshell, if I say that, uh, a good communicator would be, a good communication system would be that you, your infrastructure, the communications are in place before they launch their operations. And it has to proceed by not minutes or just in time, it has to be much ahead. And that is why uh, we ensure that uh, we are always uh, in step with uh, the infantry or uh, the, for that matter, the mechanized or the armored is there. And that is how the grouping also takes place. Right, sir. Sir, okay. another very basic question, you know, which normally, uh, you know, people ask is that all this communication is wireless. So is there a system of also, even in today's world also, to lay the cables and things like that? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very interesting question, right? So before I go there, you know, I just, uh, one aspect is uh, also there is in today's, uh, like I was saying signals. So we call electronic warfare, if I put it very simply, it is anti-signals. That means you want to disrupt the communication. So even in the uh, the tactical electronic warfare units are uh, grouped and clubbed, both in the conventional ops as well as uh, CI and CT, that is counterinsurgency, counterterrorism with the formations down to the battalions to support so that you're preventing the enemy to use their uh, communication systems. 
Now, initially, like you said, it was all wireless. Uh, so now it is also in uh, internet cyber and uh, a, a term is now coming as cyber RF, right? So uh, coming to what you said, you know, um, uh, how are we, uh, how should I put it? Uh, could you just f f uh, tell the question? I think I just, yeah, uh, I just wanted to know that, uh, you know, is, is it all wireless and now, okay, like you yeah, said, sorry. cyber, yeah, is yeah. the traditional form of cabling still there somewhere in some form yes. of signal communication? Okay, okay. that's a very really interesting thing, you know, as uh, when, when I was saying, you know, from a, from a smoke signal to pigeons as it is there. So initially from the copper wire uh, to, you know, galvanized iron wire, which was the uh, PL routes and the permanent line routes. Uh, it has now advanced into the optical domain uh, also, right? So it is not, which is just wired. So what has happened as and when uh, the the intensity of the battle, the, uh, you know, today we are at a, at a stage where uh, every entity, uh, whether it is a small weapon system, whether it is a handheld uh, infrared, uh, let me call it, uh, to put it simply for everybody, general people to understand a thermal image, which is, uh, I can put it as a binocular, which is, can see at night uh, because of the infrared or others. All these can get connected. Anyone, you can have a radars, all of them can get connected. So as a result, the dependence or the demand on communications increased. So the erstwhile copper wire has a limitation of range. Range means how many kilometers you can uh, take a, 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 a electro, after it's just electrons flowing, how much you can take that, as also how much is the bandwidth. That means what is the size of the uh, pipe through which uh, all this can come. So as it is enhanced, so what has now come up is that uh, the system has shifted onto the optical fiber. So while, uh, so there's a good mix of uh, Copper, optical fiber, satellite, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, ra wireless radio systems, cellular systems, mobile ad hoc uh, systems. So mobile ad hoc is something which is akin to the uh, cell, cell phone. Only thing is that here you don't require an infrastructure. As you move, the network rolls out. Whereas if you see the uh, erstwhile mobile today we are holding, it is it has to have a infrastructure, which is your uh, tower, the uh, mobile towers, right? So this is how it is. This is a mix. So the yardstick is how much is the size of the pipe and what is the reach? So where, whereas the copper would be very minimal within a small area of, say, uh, you know, 1.5 to 2 kilometers uh, radius, beyond that is optical. So there's an optical tactical fiber also, which is there, which is as easy to lay as the uh, field cable. You just have a dispenser pack. Rolling, so that is how it is uh, comes. So it is really the uh, communication is a mix of all these uh, more reliance towards the the uh, in the in the higher headquarters which are more static. Okay, one more thing is all uh, units which are more static, uh, say the div headquarters, brigade headquarters, core headquarters, and upwards. They are generally static, so they have adequate time, so you can connect them by laying fiber because it takes time. Uh, the infantry, the moment it launches itself or crosses or comes to the FUP, it will all be relying on either uh, the wireless, which is the radio uh, or mobile cellular or on satellite. So it is all how quickly you can uh, deploy so that your communications proceed, uh, the actual launch. So that is how it's a, a mix which is taking uh, taking place. And similarly, since the mechanized uh, forces, that is the armored and mechanized, uh, are very, uh, they maneuver a lot and they're not very static in one place. So they are generally on um, high capacity, either satellites or even uh, uh, radios, high capacity radios. But sir, one thing which I, which I would like to understand is that, uh, you know, when you have uh, communication through a system where uh, security can be be a breach and uh, interception can be there by the uh, you know rival or the enemy in that case sir uh, the traditional ways uh, you could we could also tap them they could also tap us now in today's world sir, when uh, it's one world absolutely with the uh, you know internet systems 
what are the systems armies made to make this security breach not happen? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, as a uh, as a rule, uh, which is absolutely sacrosanct and not negotiable, is any it is the uh, commander or the sender of a message who will decide what is the importance there. You know, if it is an importance is uh, governed by the time of its validity and the content, right? For example, if you see that uh, you want to bring down, you see that the enemy is just across and you have to bring down on spot, fire on him, uh, there's no need to encrypt it, right? Uh, you can just say, bring down fire there if it isn't plain because before that, by the time he can jam or something, the shell is already landed, right? So there's no uh, there. So that was the policy earlier, but now what has happened, you can't decide when to have encrypted or encrypted, or, 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 or sorry, in plain or uh, encrypted. So as a rule, every wireless system has to have uh, an um, uh, encryption device, which is there. So all the wireless are now encrypted uh, there. So de facto, there's no element of uh, doubt there whether you switch a toggle switch to go in plain or encrypted. Or to, uh, encrypted. So that is one thing is there. Similarly, every link, Every network, point to point, or everything is encrypted, and these are all by indigenous, uh, indigenously developed. You cannot rely on a crypto system, which is of somebody else, because you never know uh, they may have some uh, trap doors or something put. So all these are uh, there, and they are very, they're very advanced system of its evaluation of the encryption devices, which is done by the uh, by a uh, SAG under DRDO. So it has to be approved by them because there's a very detailed system of uh, looking out for any vulnerability and the strength. And then they'll say, okay, fine. This is the uh, time period that this script encryption system will give a cover. Like, for example, they can say, okay, fine, this will not be, you will not, and time period cover means you cannot break it in, say, one day. So you say, okay, fine, it is, uh, it gives you an uh, encryption cover of uh, 24 hours. It will be much more. So they're always on a uh, very stringent on this. It could be for 10 years and so on. So that is how they uh, work it out. So it is, as far as we are concerned, uh, everything is encrypted. Now, uh, from the domain of point-to-point -point communications, which was there, radios and wireless, now you're going uh, in network mode. Now, network mode means even the network, wireless network, which is there, maybe the, uh, you know, the, uh, mobile cellular, which is there with the right at the forward edge, to the ESCON, which is a uh, which is a, a pan India communication network based on OFC satellites and what have you, and wireless and high capacity. They are interlinked. So when you are uh, there, so the weakest, all of them have got certain uh, equipment, telecom equipment and devices, which are manufactured, uh, which may have uh, some vulnerabilities, not that it is intentional, like for example, I'll just, for the ease of um, the uh, general uh, viewers, if you're using a PC, every time you get an update on Microsoft, look, update Microsoft, it says so-and-so security update has been given. It happens almost generally every Tuesday. That is just to, you know, some vulnerability has been discovered and they fix it. So it is a fixing, a, uh, I'll not say a bug intention, but vulnerability has been addressed. So similarly, when it is coming up, uh, it happened. It's a twenty-four by seven there because the networks of the armed forces are absolutely, uh, you know, uh, isolated. They're not connected. They're uh, standalone. They're not connected to the internet or there. Uh, and wherever they they're get, getting connected, there are very stringent rules so that no information uh, can uh, go out there. Right. So. Despite that, uh, since the issue of supply chain comes up, in today's uh, modern uh, world, uh, as was prov proved by the Wuhan uh, virus, that the supply chain or the electronics components, or for the example, the processors, are now a strat strategic asset of a nation. And that is why India is actually progressing towards self-reliance into uh, manufacturing these wafers. Wafers are nothing else but the chips which is being there and programming it, right? 
Well, that, despite best of the efforts, there will still be certain compounds which you may you may get from uh, some other country. And when you say Edward country, it is a trusted, uh, friendly country. But you never know; it could be uh, intentional or unintentional vulnerability which may come up. So, as a result, this supply chain uh, issue may come up any time. Or since your network will always be under uh, attack, watch. An attack cannot be uh, a, a physical attack or a. The thing is just is monitoring it. They are just looking for vulnerabilities to be exploited at the right time. So as a result, uh, we cannot, um, uh, you know, just put our guard, put our guards down. So that is why we have concept of uh, defensive cyber. That means all our networks are protected. There's a uh, there's a um, uh, there's a security operation. Uh, center which is looking after these cyber threats and attacks and any attempts or any uh, um, you know uh, uh, behavior which is not routine or otherwise uh, is uh, addressed so this is a very uh, complex and ongoing process and uh, it is uh, done 24 by 7 and that is how we make sure that the networks are protected uh, while it may be easier to protect uh, now the question will come if your Defense networks are uh, isolated. They're not connected anywhere. Uh, they're watertight, uh, not uh, interconnected. How the vulnerabilities come up? It could be either from the supply chain or it could be when you're connecting it to the forward uh, elements, which are uh, based on uh, electromagnetic uh, or wireless. So that is how we are, we are uh, handling it. Right, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, when you talked of supply chain, uh, one very basic question is that in the world of Make It India and Atmanirvar Bharat, uh, how much of it is there in the core of signals? Okay. Um, you know, um, one thing which is that any system which is used in uh, battlefield, and when I'm saying that it is either taxi 3i or something, uh, it is ensured that the supply chain is from a trusted source. Okay, uh, that is there. You, uh, to put it very bluntly, we will not buy any, not even a transistor or a register or a capacitor which is being manufactured in China, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be from a known country. And then uh, this uh, is put into, uh, put into effect. Uh, in uh, various uh, agencies have been set up who look at this if there's no uh, malware hidden in the in the firmware or something like that. So that is one which is done, right? So that is how we ensure because uh, whatever you might say, uh, we are still a little distant from uh, developing uh, processes of very complex processes of high computing power because today the, the world is on uh, miniaturization and uh, that is where the computing, you know, you, if you see um, your mobile phone so small, uh, this is having such a fantastic processing power, so much of storage and so much of speed uh, there, you know, and data capacities. So when you are looking, we don't have that. And it's not that we are not, we will not be able to do it. It's complex. You can, you can set up there. But what happens is also based on the cost. You know, if you just imagine there's a, a wafer which is so... Uh, which is running into you know uh, uh, you know uh, microns and things like that. Even if there's a little impurity in the air or in the water, because there's there's a lot of uh, uses of water and uh, air it should be dust proof and all. If that is uh, not there, these impurities will get embedded into the uh, wafer. So the cost of purification is very high. And that is why, you know, somebody says that why is Vietnam giving a cheaper chip, electronic chip than India? Because it's just because of the uh, cost of purification and ensuring uh, that the impurities don't come in. So that is which uh, can happen. So uh, we are slowly progressing into it. Uh, there's also an attempt which was made uh, into making an indigenous uh, operating system because right now it is... Reliance is only uh, on uh, Microsoft, as also uh, with uh, Linux, Red Hat Linux. And uh, there was an attempt made uh, by the uh, CDAC uh, BOSS system, where, where of course, uh, 
uh, it didn't mature much because uh, you could not compete the uh, addressing of vulnerabilities uh, in as much uh, uh, in, in terms of manpower, skill sets, as also the uh, finances, right? So this is what one is uh, prog progressing towards, uh, but it is still a little attempt was made, uh, but the results were not uh, up to the satisfaction of the armed forces. But it's ongoing. I'm sure very soon there will be a, a indigenous uh, operating system. So slowly the, the progress is being made. Uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, uh, while this is happening, um, adequate security checks are in place. Right, sir. And sir, uh, when you talk of manpower and then you talk of, uh, you know, uh, systems of keeping this manpower updated, uh, what, is, what are the training, uh, you know, procedures we have? Are they absolutely set? Are they absolutely Indian? Do we need to still send people abroad to get trained in the technology? Because Signals is high technology. Yes. And I, like you said, you know, most of it is coming from abroad. So in that case, what are the training uh, systems? Okay. Um, you know, uh, if I go back uh, to when we were there, I mean, before us, when you one used to do uh, post-graduation, uh, there used to be certain uh, PG uh, seats uh, where they would do it in either in the UK or USA. Uh, now that is not there because our own IITs are absolutely world class uh, training institutes and uh, and actually like when I was doing my uh, MTech and IIT uh, Madras, I found my professors were uh, phenomenal. I mean they were way ahead. Like uh, in uh, 91, 92, uh, they were looking at the triple play. That means on one computer only you could have voice, video, and data. Simultaneous, like what we are now doing is actually a video conferencing, voice, video, data, right? And it's been so. Uh, yeah. So they were, uh, they had matured to that level, and uh, even in uh, computing. And that time, I still remember the, we still had mainframes and uh, XTs and uh, 80s, which were there. These were computers. If you look at that, uh, the your mobile phone, the cheapest, which is just costing about three thousand rupees, it has got more computing power than what and storage than what that had. So, as and when this came up. Uh, India actually has uh, taken uh, uh, lead in in uh, in um, rolling out communication systems, and there's adequate expertise available here in India. Uh, there are there were certain challenges of uh, manufacture of uh, you know uh, system satellite system that also very uh, quickly that is getting addressed. But yes, one thing is very uh, should be known is not only here is worldwide is that uh, there are certain modules, which I say, I can say modules or components, which are manufactured exclusively for a particular task. Like, for example, if you're doing a, uh, you know, a, a, a software conversion from analog to digital, that means after your voice is analog, digital, there's certain very complex processes which have been made. So it's no, there's no point in uh, you know, setting up an in, uh, uh, infrastructure which will cost you, you know, billions of uh, dollars when you can get the same thing uh, by it as a raw module. And then you can, uh, you know, embed your own uh, firmware or the uh, software into it. So that will happen. I mean, that is something which makes more business sense. Yes, so for something which is very, very critical uh, there, uh, you know, for example, uh, there's a top secret talk between the, you know, your... Uh, say PMO to the uh, chiefs or to the NSA, which could be exclusive net, which is very, that could be absolutely there. It makes more sense. Whereas when you're looking at uh, mass scales, uh, where you're making for the armed forces and uh, its numbers are going to be just a couple of lakhs, but you spend billions of dollars, the cost of procuring of that equipment will become so exorbitant that your capital Fund because when you say capital budget procurement, after all, the R and D cost will also be recovered from the army. It will not match. So that is how you do balance between the the cost, your capability, and the skill. Skill sets are phenomenal uh, there in the, the way they are growing. In, in uh, one has to be very proud of the uh, the skill sets of the skinware of the Indi of the Indian. Uh, and it's not only the armed forces. I'm talking about all across. 
So they are doing phenomenal work. So th- there's no uh, then and how to develop this? There are a lot of people who are actually interacting with the academia and uh, doing this, and to enhance these skill sets all across. There are uh, training programs with the with the academies, and so now you know since AI and cyber RF everything is there and robotics is there. So you're doing uh, post graduation in this, and there's some people who are doing doctorate in these fields. Then that is how you're building up the the uh, skill sets and the threshold and the capability. Yes, the um, the idea of the N- uh, NDU National Defense University akin to what was there, so that you retain this step and somebody who's uh, wants to step out uh, goes out you know this has to be a whole nation uh, uh, affair it can't uh, effort it can't be just you know exclusively defense or uh, say the uh, the uh, civil it has to be there whatever is the expertise developed in uh, defense should be used in civil and vice versa because every technology today is what you will use it can be used for military as well as uh, civil, civil. And sir, uh, what happens to the training of the Jawans? Because for them also, it's a massive change when it comes to uh, latest technology being adopted by the core. So uh, have there been some changes in the training uh, programs of the Jawans, sir? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, let me first, before Jawans, let me, you know, one thing that the technology threshold of the signal officers or technical officers in the technical arms is very high. Uh, you know, uh, when we passed out f- from the in, uh, IMA, our training was primarily to look at, uh, you know, to be an effective uh, infantry uh, officer. Uh, that's a general, and of course, the focus would always be on character building and, you know, hmm. both uh, physical, mental, and moral uh, strength. So when I came into signals, uh, I was at par with anybody else who had got trained into in IMA, right? Yeah. So there's nothing special training which was there. A similar thing was for the people in the artillery or engineers or uh, the armored people, right? So you had uh, exposure, but it was more a very uh, a, a, a view from the outside, you know, a peep into this. So after that is where the training starts. Like before I went for my VIOs, uh, it is my uh, ustads in the when I say ustads, it's your you know uh, line Lance Naik, Naiks and Havaldars and uh, JCOs who taught me the uh, nuances of uh, communications, both uh, technical as also uh, the operational and employ- em- employment and rollout. Right. So that is what I learned from them, and of course there was a guidance which was given from the officers. But my uh, prime gurus like. Uh, for uh, for every officer is the drill ustads in INA for your discipline and uh, character. Here it was the NCOs and JCOs who were there, my uh, gurus. I, I can rattle out their names, you know, Havaldar, JS Punia, you know, HS Punia and uh, Venkat and so on, right? Uh, or uh, Subhidar Meena. So now why I brought this out is, look, this is the threshold or level of training which the uh, Jawans who enter as recruits into the training centers reach. So they are they reach their attain that level. That means obviously something right is being done. And how it is being done is uh, whenever they uh, enter, they are entered into various uh, trades. We call them trades. Whether he's going to be a, a you know a radio mechanic or a say a, a lineman and so on and so forth. They've got a lot of trades. Uh, so that is how there are training uh, battalions who uh, teach them, They're either the military training uh, regiments or technical training regiments. So they impart this. So this is a basic training so that when he comes to the unit, that is where his predecessors or stars who have got those skills, uh, they, they will start uh, uh, you know, refining his. There. So the foundation is laid in these TTRs and then the... Uh, the growth, the blooming is, happens in the units or exercises and, and so on and so forth. And it's in units, the training is uh, ruthlessly uh, conducted. There's no compromise on that. And especially in exercise or otherwise annual training camps, companies are training, everything is there. So that is exactly how it happens. After this, to, you know, to 
Quantum with the the way the communications and computers are changing. Uh, so refresh him. There are various other courses which are held. So these courses are held at unit level also. Uh, that technical uh, cadres will be held at units. Of course, there are certain uh, guidelines which are defined by the higher headquarters. Uh, I'm talking the line directorates, and uh, there are certain things which are uh, formal training which is given in the uh, institutes like MCT. There's a formal signals course and uh, ciphers and everything. So they do. So make sure that everything is. Uh, Current and we are always a step ahead of what is required. Right, sir. And yeah. sir, uh, this is a lovely conversation, sir. Very different from what, like, what we always do. But the truth is that I would like to understand one thing from you, which is that uh, we are the Signal Core, which is the best Signal Core. And but are we at par with our two neighbors who are not so friendly? Okay. No. Uh, so with this, let me just take to the future, right? Today, the way the geopolitics are there, you are actually always at a situation of uh, no war, no peace, whether it is on with the Western or Northern, right? So it is always better to be smart. I'll give a very small example. In the glacier heights of say, Siachen or uh, Eastern Ladakh or Arunachal, there's no point in you exposing yourself 24 by 7 in the weather. It's not that you don't have your foot on ground. The boots are there, adequate is there. But you don't exhaust yourself or expose yourself and suffer casualties because of the climate or weather or exhaustion, right? So it is best to start making an intelligent use of remotely piloted uh, systems. A good beginning would be, suppose you have, you know, you have a, a, a protective patrol or you're having a recce uh, patrol going out to see whether it's there. It's so easy to send out a small little uh, miniature uh, drone, which can, which got cameras, everything for the day and night. And it can, on live, it can uh, get you the information. Yes, there may be certain issues of uh, crossing over the uh, line of control or line of actual control, it's much better that you can go and this can go plonk itself on a vintage point on your side and look there. So that is how you are actually reduced in a, in a pre perpetual no war, no peace scenario. You're re reducing the fatigue of physical fatigue so that you can now concentrate and you are preserving your manpower there, right? And not unnecessarily exposing them to the weather and the lot of the majority of the casualties are actually because of the accidents of weather or uh, in high altitudes or otherwise, even in deserts if it's very hot it happens. so that is one uh, way of smart use of technology there and today uh, uh, when you look at uh, China they are doing it because uh, they are, their their uh, troops are not as hardy as our uh, troops of uh, India, and uh, you'll be surprised that uh, even the uh, Thambis, we very, uh, you know, we call them with a lot of affection. Thambis have been uh, deployed in uh, glacier and doing a marvelous job. So it is not that it's only the people from, you know, uh, Leh Ladakh, like Das Scouts or Kumonis, Garwalis will be uh, deployed there. Everyone has got so well tuned to the mountain warfare that they are uh, uh, phenomenal there. So there's no dearth of so this is a disadvantage advantage which China has. So they have uh, taken this weakness sub, 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 and strengthened it with their technology, right? And when I am looking at this, there's a lot of thing is also you know in perception. So they will you know have a demonstration of some technology, some drone, something there, and it is just to put a little bit of. Uh, perception management and uh, try and uh, play on the psyche of the uh, Indian troops deployed that look we are uh, we are inferior to them we are not uh, the mind and body is far superior to uh, them and technology is something which is lacking but now with the way uh, the technology is being inducted and I think smart is what is there so I don't think we have a, a major disadvantage yes 
there is a disadvantage in um, in uh, st structurally organizing these aspects and not doing it in piecemeal reactions because of the situation as it is unfolding in the uh, line of control. And I'm sure this is happening. There are a lot of people thinking on it. Yes, and uh, it, it's, though we are a little behind, but not very far behind. Uh, ultimately, whereas you'll be fighting uh, smart to reduce physical fatigue there, but that is going to be overcome by this. Uh, yeah, you're, so that is what is uh, actually happening. Uh, right, happen. sir. And when I look at uh, the Western there, um, unfortunately, um, they're mentally and uh, at least physically, we are, we've got very similar uh, genes and uh, mentality, but the way the their armed forces have been, uh, I'll not say corrupted, but the way the armed forces have uh, played into uh, various fields which they should not have entered into, uh, that is what has made them weak, much weaker. So I don't think there's a major issue. Yes, uh, very soon we need to uh, bridge this gap of technology and bring in uh, aspects of, you know, cyberspace, cloud, C3, you know, virtualization and all these things uh, have to come into one umbrella. Right, so, so thank you very much. It was really wonderful. You know, you've given us such a plethora, uh, which we normally when we do a discussion, we always feel is missing. And we always feel, you know, that you, you need to, to encompass every part of uh, a profession. And you've done it beautifully, sir. It was mm -hmm. wonderful to have you, sir, in the chat room. We're looking forward to having you again with us. And then, you know, when we talk of high technology, then we'll talk of, you know, what is there with us, what is there with the Indian Army, what is its wish list. But we leave it for the Corps of Signals Day, sir. And today we'll uh, wrap it up here. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful to have you here on the uh, eve of Army Day. And uh, Jay Hind, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's always so kind of you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye.